for the best part of 20 years, Time Team has been shoveling and scraping its way around the country looking for previously undiscovered archaeology. We've found villas and roundhouses and castles, even the occasional skeleton. Over this time, our jumpers have changed a bit and our hairstyles have changed rather a lot sometimes even disappeared completely. But the one thing that's changed more than anything else is the role a particular technology has played in our ability to find the past. That technology is, of course, the dark art of geophys, and we thought that now was the time to celebrate it, or at least finally try and find out how it works. time team we dig things up. This time we're doing things in reverse. We're burying them. Why? Well it's all in the name of science. Geophysical science to be exact. We want to conduct a little time team experiment. Well, after 20 years of time team, we finally want to work out whether or not these machines work, how well they work, and probably most importantly, whether John really can interpret, or should I say bluff, the information that they give him. So, John, if you're man enough to take up the challenge, we have buried 10 items over there. Here's a list of them, and we want you to correctly identify everyone. OK? And we've actually put in a red herring, just to be a nuisance. The earliest archaeologists didn't have the advantage of geophysics, so they used to bang the ground and listen to the vibrations to decide what was below. A system that was at best rather hit and miss. In fact, until the 1940s, geophysics was only used to discover underground minerals like oil. But then, in 1946, an archaeologist called Professor Richard Atkinson stuck a probe into a field near Dorchester and discovered some underground barrows. The world of archaeology changed forever. Well, at least the technology did. They kept the beards. Time Team first used geophysics in 1993 when we visited Athelney in Somerset to search for Alfred the Great's famous abbey. Hello, Phil. Yeah, it's Mick. We've just arrived in the Land Rover. Where are you over? When we got on site, we had no idea that what we were about to see was history in the making. Excited, we're all getting quite excited. Now, you do remember at breakfast this morning, the last comment was geophysics will be the answer to it all. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, you're now going to see in front of your very eyes a plot that will astound you. This is if the technology works. <laughs> <laughs> Where we get high resistance, we'll have dark concentrations of dots on the paper. What do you think now, looking back on those first results in Athelney? They're so much cruder than anything you could produce nowadays, aren't they? Well, they were, but, I mean, they were still quite stunning. Mm. I mean, we weren't expecting anything anywhere near as clear as that. Oh, oh, truth, look at that! that. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. That's, that's the monastic yeah. church, is it, at the top? Oh, oh, we're not, we're not From our point of view, it was even more amazing because English Heritage had surveyed the site six years earlier and they found nothing. The site was protected, so we weren't allowed to dig. But thanks to Geophys, we could tell the exact layout of the abbey without even touching a trowel. There was a lot riding on that show, wasn't there? Yeah, it's the first we'd ever done. You know, we knew we couldn't excavate, so to get those results coming out the back of the van... I mean, I still look back and I'm amazed. It's going to make a lot of archaeologists redundant, <laughs> So Athelney Abbey actually started here 
and spread all the way back past that monument there. And no one knew about it for centuries and centuries till about three minutes ago. I think that's a pretty good first for time, team. Thanks to John's gadgetry, we could now build up a complete picture of King Alfred's Abbey. But we wanted to turn the clock back further to the time when Alfred was hiding out from the Vikings. In the 9th century, Athelney was virtually an island surrounded by marshes. It made a perfect stronghold for Alfred and his men. With this in mind, John and the Geophys team checked out the neighbouring fields and made another breakthrough. Signs of iron remains in the soil. Could these iron deposits be proof for Alfred arming his men against Viking invaders? What better place to examine the evidence than the local pub? One of the things that, that's, <laughs> that's come out straight away is this thing. I think it's probably a bloom, that is the original lump of iron that's produced in the, in the early furnaces. There would have been a lot of metal working on a site like this in Alfred's time. But that ties in quite nicely with the geophysics work. But even this morning they were saying there's a lot of ferrous activity, you know, like smithing and that sort of thing, arming people up and getting them ready, if, if it's of that period. So we needed to date it. Iron smelting slags come in a, a variety of shapes and sizes, and they can be characteristic of certain periods. By looking at it, I'm much more happy that it's pretty definitely post-Roman, but pre, perhaps, 10th or 11th century AD. For time team, Athelney was a revelation. Geophys, working hand-in-hand hand with traditional archaeology, indicated that this area was once the site of massive industrial activity. Had we, in fact, found Alfred the Great's weapons factory? We had to wait a decade to find out. Ten years later, we're back to crack the secrets of Alfred's hideaway in the marshes. In celebration of our 100th Time Team programme, we return to Athelney with permission to dig and the latest geophys technology. This time, John was hoping to give us a 3D image of the Abbey's remains. What we're going to do now is radar. Right. We've got a superb plan. What the radar can give us in addition is actually depth information. King Alfred founded this Abbey in 893 AD. What we wanted the radar to tell us was how much had survived and what condition it was in. What we've done is we've taken... John's radar results confirmed that his original very basic resistance printout from ten years earlier was spot on. And now, as well as the layout of the abbey, we had depth information too. It was an opportunity to use the radar and go down through the wall footings and into the earth. We're at this ground surface here about 40 centimetres, we're just starting to see wall lines. And as we go deeper... Unfortunately, the news wasn't good. We discovered that those walls were really sort of shallow. They'd been robbed out so much, and there were only sort of footings still surviving. As we continue to look into the ground, we're disappearing below the actual foundation level. But thanks to radar, we didn't have to dig to find that out. It was a real technological leap forward in the ten years since we were here last, isn't it? You won't need to dig in a few years' time. Radar has shown that the stones from the abbey walls had been removed and possibly reused. But what about the elusive weapons factory on the opposite side of the site? We were hoping to find evidence of industrial Saxon metalwork that could be linked to Alfred's army. Cue another job for Geophys and a specialist metal detector. Yeah, so if we put it on to the, uh, the sort of the background natural, yeah. we're getting readings about 30 or 40. Over here, nearly 1,300. It's really, really magnetic, that is. This was a good indication of metal deposits in this area. So if the field was the site of Alfred's weapon factory, what would it have looked like? Victor, our historical illustrator, gave us an idea. What Victor's showing us is the iron working process, the intense activity. But what we've been excavating today is what's gone into the ditch. Debris that's been swept out from the smithy to fill the ditch. What are the things here might we actually still be able to find? The, the, the hole for the post for the, for the anvil and the debris that will be scattered around. Oh, presumably it's not a sword or anything like that, is it? It looks like a scythe. Yeah. What's it actually in? Um, well, all this black stuff is appears to be metalworking debris, perhaps smithing debris or something like that. Any idea what it might be, Kai? It is an Anglo-Saxon scrammer sax, just a small, curved-backed knife. It's more evidence for Anglo-Saxon smithing. To help us find the smallest bits of iron, we commandeered the use of a really high-tech instrument. 
a magnet. So these are bits that have come from this process here. That's right. We call it hammer scale. They're flakes of metal that has come off, and we know that's very characteristic of blacksmithing. Finally, we found evidence of a possible Saxon workshop. This stone could have supported one of the posts. Geophiz led the way at Athelney. It showed us the site of the original abbey. And without Geophiz, we probably wouldn't have found Alfred's forge at all. What all this added up to was that Geophys helped us discover the Isle of Kings, the stronghold where Alfred prepared his army to face the Viking invasion and later built that famous abbey. Geophys had earned its place at the heart of Time Team. Back to our Time Team experiment. We've buried ten items in a field, including a bicycle, some bricks, laptops and phones, among other things. And we've given John Gator the unenviable task of trying to locate them using the best geophys kit in the world. As in most Time Team digs, John goes for the magnetometer first. OK, you're starting off with the magnetometer. Why is that? We use the magnetometer in most surveys. It picks up the widest range of archaeological features and it's the quickest instrument we've got. It doesn't involve putting probes in the ground or anything, so we can walk over the ground quickly. How does it actually work? Well, it measures small magnetic changes and where you've got buried materials, they will have different magnetic fields and that's what you detect. And what can it find best? Well, it's really good for detecting things like kilns, metalworking areas, because there's been lots of burning and you've got strong magnetism. OK, we've got all sorts of different things buried away. Which of these things do you think you might get with the mag? Well, you should get bricks because they're magnetic. A bike, yes, you'll get that. What about the mobile phone and the laptop? Yes. They'll have strong magnetic signals, so we should detect those easily. Any problems with it? The instruments are so sensitive that any metal in the vicinity affects them. Uh, an electricity pylon, uh, a building, corrugated iron, and so you can't work near to those. All our zips have to be plastic, um, otherwise they'd affect the instrument. And even, you know, the magnetic strip in a credit card, mm. that would send the instrument wild. Ah, well, that explains John's dress sense and why he never buys around. John's got his usual anxious face on as he tries to find some pattern in his electronic tea leaves. I don't know why he gets so worried. It's only public humiliation if he fails. You ought to be used to that by now. During the 17 or 18 years we've been doing Time Team, we've nearly always tended to wheel out Geophys at the beginning of day one. This is partly so that we can use our time more efficiently and locate our trenches more precisely, but also because it gives our diggers a rest at the beginning of the first day. But the first machine that the Geophys team nearly always use is this one, the magnetometer. And it's the magnetometer that you, John, have used first today, isn't it? Yeah, and I've just got the results and I mean look that was the 20 meter square before you buried the objects and this is the same square with the magnetometer after you've buried everything but I need to look at the traces and there you can immediately see the strong iron signals that so I can be confident we've got metal objects at those point so which of our buried finds do you think you might have the bricks um, yeah the tires as long as they've got steel rims in them, um, the bike definitely, shopping basket we should get and certainly the mobile phone. Tell me John, over here we've got the trench which is represented by this board here, so where do you think these five go? Oh, I, I can't do that yet. Oh. No, I, I need to see the other data, the, the resistance results and the radar results. Um, at the moment all I can say is those are the ferrous objects and they go through the ferrous spikes. Alright, we'll just stick them here for the moment and you'll be more accurate later on, all right? Yeah, give me a bit more time. More time? Surely not. Nothing's changed there, then. In 2001, Time Team visited Normanton in Lincolnshire on the trail of an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. Skeletons had been found when a water company laid a pipe in a trench, so we knew exactly where to dig. Or at least, we thought we did. Normanton was a big site, so Geophys started at the crack of dawn, watched by an unusually captive audience. Mick, why are we so certain that there is an Anglo-Saxon cemetery here? 
Because they put a pipe in some years ago and you looked at the trench that was dug and you found That's burials right. along it. That's right, yes. Yeah. So presumably what we can do now is get John to geophys the field. He can identify where the bodies are and then we can excavate them. Ah. Not quite that easy. <laughs> because? Burials are really difficult targets for us. We detect the graves into which the burials are placed. Now when they dug the, the pipe trench a couple of years ago, the bodies were really close to the surface, there was no deep grave. So presumably that makes it easier for you? No, it actually makes it more difficult. If you're digging into clay and then fill the grave with clay, you've got clay in clay, you know, it's very difficult to spot. Although we knew there was a Saxon cemetery somewhere in the vicinity, it didn't look like Geophys were going to be able to pinpoint it. So we want to start 10 metres that way? I think 15 metres. So the only positional reference we had was the water pipe. If you start your trench here, going in that direction, you're bound to hit burials according to their yeah. plan. The water company had said that the pipe went through here. The problem was that although Geophys couldn't see the plastic pipe, their results suggested that it might actually run through here. On the geophysics, there's our distance from the edge, yeah. 10. If we go another 10, then we're there. Oh, yeah. right. right. So it doesn't match up. So it doesn't match up with the geophysics at all. Clearly, John wasn't happy. But we had to get on, so we decided to strip the area just to the left of where we were told the pipe was. We hoped to find the edge of the previous trench and then extend into unexplored territory. It doesn't look to be any features in it at all. But when we dug our trenches, we didn't find a thing. Nothing at all, John. I mean, I mean it's so clear on here. Yeah, I, see, I think we ain't really deep enough. I think we're probably going to have to get the digger back in. So we kept on digging... ..and digging... ..and digging. Look, we've got a mound of earth here and a trench and another mound of earth and another mound of earth and another huge trench here and then a long, thin trench and a great long mound of earth there. And what have we found? A tooth. Two teeth. <laughs> Oh, great. So where's the rest of the body? What's gone wrong? Well, I think the simple answer is we've been looking in the wrong place. We've been digging in the wrong place. Why? Because we thought the pipe trench was further over that way than it actually is. We were told it was further that well, way. Well, that's right. The water board did actually tell us earlier in the week that it was, it was further over that way, probably by about 10 metres. So our two trenches, which are supposed to be alongside it, are actually too far over that way. Hold on, John. What was really going on there? Well, nobody listened to us like normal. Yeah. I mean, we knew the pipe was in the wrong place. We tried to tell people, but they just went on with it. But actually, it wasn't a disaster, was it? No, the geophysics wasn't a disaster. I mean, we got some really nice Roman buildings. And what you often get near to Roman buildings are Anglo-Saxon burials. Mm -hmm. And that's what we eventually found in the trench. So, no, we came up trumps. We now had to investigate the Roman element of the site and its relationship with the later Saxon cemetery. Can you see this area in here, mm -hmm. where it's definite sort of increase in noise? Now, that's normally what we would uh, expect from a building. So can you give us a target where we might have a wall or something definite that would tell us what yeah. sort of building it might have been? Well, I think oh. we'd like a trench in this sort of area here. So we dug yet another trench. But would you believe it? The first thing we came across... That's bone. This was exciting news, because archaeologists have found that Anglo-Saxons sometimes buried their dead right up to the walls of Roman buildings. There seems to be some sort of relationship mm. between uh, cemeteries and uh, Roman sites, particularly high-status Roman sites, which is why even though there was very little evidence of a Roman villa in the records, it's quite possible that there was a high-status site of some sort very close by. So we've got arms here, upper arm bone there, lower arm bone there, and there's a tooth coming up there, so obviously we've got the head at this end. And before we knew it, we had skeletons everywhere. And one of them, buried with his spear, was a particularly interesting find. Who's going to have a spear? Is it just going to be your average sort of Joe Saxon, or, or, or is this going to be somebody with, you know, a bit of clout? It's been argued that the people buried with spears and other weapons were, in fact, ethnic Anglo-Saxons. They were the descendants of Anglo people who had migrated across from the, from the North Sea and uh, actually created England. 
So this spear suggested that we'd uncover the grave of an important man, probably directly descended from the Angles, who arrived in this country from northwest Germany in the second half of the 5th century. And although we use the term Anglo-Saxon to describe this time in British history, this particular cemetery belonged to the Angles, the tribe that gave their name to what is now England. While the rest of the team were getting all excited about skeletons, Geophys continued surveying the area and came up with a stunning revelation. Instead of just a single villa next to the burial ground, they discovered the remains of a previously unknown Roman community. If you'd have been here 1,500 years ago, this wouldn't have been an empty field. There'd have been a complete Roman village here, and we would have been walking up the main street along this line. You can see that on this set of geophysics results. So we stood about here in the middle of this street. You know, going from one pipe trench with a few burials to a complete sort of Roman village sat within its fields is, is fantastic. So geophys really excelled themselves. Their magnetometer results completely changed our understanding of the site. Back to our time team experiment. We've buried some everyday items in a field and using various geophys machines, John Gator is trying to correctly locate them. Right, John, you started with the mag. What's next? Resistance. Ah, this one here. How does that work? You send electric currents into the ground and you measure the flow of the electricity. So if you've got a wall, stones, a solid object below the ground, the currents can't pass through, so you get high resistance on the readings. If you've got a waterlogged ditch or a silted up pond, the electric currents pass through that easily and you get low resistance. Any problems? The weather, really. Different times of year, you get different results. You need contrasts in moisture. What things on the list do you think the res might find, then? In these conditions, I'm not confident. We should get the bricks, we ought to get the concrete blocks. Anything else is going to be a bonus. Oh, come on, it's a great machine. Oh, well, if he doesn't find them, I suppose he can always go back to banging on the ground. John the res, what have we got? Well, as I suspected, it's far more difficult in the conditions we've been working up against. That's the square before we buried the objects. These are the results after. There are a few changes that are definitely visible. High resistance there, high resistance there, down here, in that area there. I'm confident we've got bricks. I'm confident we've got concrete blocks. Um, I think we've got the bin, because whether it's plastic or metal, it doesn't matter, there'll be a big air gap. Yeah. The electric currents can't flow through that. Tyres, rubber, they'll stop currents in theory. Um, shopping basket, maybe... The toilet, that may mm -hmm. well be solid. Um, the others, you know, I'm not quite so confident on those. OK, do you want to put these in, then? Uh, toilet, that's a new one. Tyres we've yeah. already got, yeah. bins new, yep. bricks we've got, and concrete blocks are new. Do you want to start putting them in their locations? <laughs> no, not yet, no. <laughs> you know me. No. Yes, I do. What springs to mind? Needles and a haystack. If there's one archaeological task that Geophys might have been invented for, it's finding lost Roman walls. The Romans made a lot of their stuff out of stone, and stone buildings are a dream target for Geophys. And the one tool in the Geophys kit that is better at that job than anything else is this, the resistivity machine. It's also very good for aerating your lawn. Turk Dean in Gloucestershire was one place where that little beauty really came into its own. For centuries, this Gloucestershire field has been untouched, but we reckon that underneath it lies a big secret, one of the largest Roman villas yet to be excavated in this country. There are uniform faint lines on this field. They were first spotted during the drought year of 1976. These are called parch marks and occur when grass growing above buried stone walls dies due to lack of water. Oh, look oh, at it's that! It's quite clearly laid out, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. it hasn't disappeared. And there's more stuff down here, look! Yeah. In 1997, another dry summer, Time Team went to Turk Dean to investigate. 
there's a line across there, and then there's another one goes off up, up this way. And if you actually look at them closely, what you've actually got is that it's greener there and greener there, but the grass is actually dead in that line there, look. As usual, the first step was to start with geophys. They should be able to pick up walls and features not visible in the parch marks. God, what do you Lord, think of that? that's absolutely I mean, fantastic. It's absolutely isn't it? astounding. I mean, must be one of the clearest ones ever. Possibly yeah. a gatehouse, gardens These in the middle. Corridors and rooms yeah. up here. Look at this. Yeah. So it's absolutely fantastic. Do you believe it? There's definitely something there. Oh. Oh. This was by miles the clearest result we'd ever had. There appeared to be a complete Roman villa just below the surface. We immediately started to dig, and bingo, within a few minutes we hit stone walls. Oh, look at that. It's just underneath, isn't it, eh? Ooh. Followed by some extraordinary finds. Oh, mate, sorry to have been away so long. How's it going? Oh, it's going really well, Phil. Look what Niles has found. Oh, what? The keyhole of the door. You can see the Roman putting his key in there. As the dig progressed, questions started to be raised about the layout. That's the main range of buildings over there, the main yeah. part of the house. The, 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 the baths is across the courtyard. This is certainly in an odd position if you, yeah. if you look at other villa layouts. Further investigation by the Geophys team provided some unexpected results. It now looks to us as though we've got a third range coming across here. So, so more walls down there. More here. walls, yeah. a whole range of buildings. Which presumably would double the size of the villa. Yes, I mean, we've not just got one courtyard right. here, we've got the second courtyard. The original survey outlined an imposing 4th century Roman villa. But that wasn't the end of the story. I'm shattered. Oh, I dread to think what the team like. What's, like. what's, what's all this? <laughs> We've now extended to right up the hill. Hang on, so we're here. This is we're what we were looking for. We're actually at this trench here what now. What's all this then? Well, <laughs> it's <laughs> another wing. It's another corridor, <laughs> and it's going right up to the hill. I've put a ranging pole on the top. Oh. John's final set of geophys results knocked us for six. As well as the first villa, John had discovered another villa situated further up the hill. This second building would have lain undiscovered if it weren't for Geophys. In 2009, Time Team went to Friars Wash in Hertfordshire to investigate some strange marks on an aerial survey. The marks seemed to be the outline of a Roman temple, but these are very rare. In fact, in 15 years, Time Team had never discovered one. So could John and his resistivity machine be about to find Time Team's very first Roman temple? Well, no. At least not at first, although, to be fair, it wasn't really Geophys's fault. How many times on Time Team have we gone on day one, oh, we may have a Roman temple here, and do we get a Roman temple? Yeah, um... You mean, it, yeah, no? <laughs> <laughs> they have proved elusive, Tony. They certainly have. <laughs> but, Tony, when you've got aerial photographs of that quality with crop marks like that and you've got a plan that is a square within a square, it screams out of you. Roman temple. Before Geophys could start their survey, Henry had the difficult task of using a 30-year-old aerial photograph to pinpoint the location of the possible temples. This was vital, as Geophys needed to know which bit of the field to survey first. The temples are really clear in the aerial photograph. Yeah. And, well, they're not quite so clear on the geophysics. Can you explain why? Well, I think they've actually been plough damaged over ah! the years. Oh, no. I, 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 that's my feeling. I, I, I might be wrong. It could be that just because it's a temple, it doesn't show as a magnetic anomaly. But it wasn't long before we uncovered Roman walls. This looks really good for the base of a wall, and it's about a metre extending towards you. It is more substantial than I thought it was, but crucially, it's bang on where I thought it ought to be. Not everyone, though, seemed as happy as Phil. The geophys and the air photos don't seem to marry up. I'm in a bit of a muddle. Is it just me? <laughs> no, it's not just you. <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on. We've tried resistance now, and, look, when you draw the outlines of where the temple should be, OK, we've got something that goes with that one, but look at this. 
There's nothing in the resistance data that correlates with that. I simply don't understand what's going on. Stuart, the landscape investigator, used a bit of old-fashioned geometry to solve the puzzle. Well, the, the problem was that Henry was trying to get the computer to do something it couldn't really do because the photograph was very oblique. If you draw the straight line between the hedge line and the bungalow, it goes right through the middle of the two temple sites. So if you trace that line on the ground, which I've done with the poles, it goes right up the middle there. And it was clear we had one temple this side of the line there, and we had another temple under the grass of that side. So the good news is you've still got a temple, it's just that we were digging the wrong one. We thought we were here on the photograph, but in fact we were here. The man behind this mistake was Henry, who had difficulty relating the 1970s photograph to the modern field. He now had to start from scratch and replot the position of the two temples. Henry, after the fiasco of yesterday's surveying, <laughs> you'd better get this right. Of course, of course. What can go wrong, Phil? Once the geophys was finally making sense, John could extend his survey and came up with a real surprise. We've got the temples there, and we've got this superb ring feature, well, with a, a central sort of blob. What do you think it might be, Francis? Well, the ring ditch looks like it could be around the outside of a Bronze Age barrow, with the central thing being a grave. I'm not certain that that's a ditch. Right. I think it could actually be a, a stony feature, a, a flint wall. Um, it's more likely then to be a Roman mausoleum going with the temple, or perhaps a shrine also going with the temple. So what might be in it? Well, all sorts of things. I mean, burial. Well, that's why we're going to dig it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Ask us any questions. <laughs> And while Phil was investigating the potential shrine, John came up with yet another possible building. OK, so what have we got, John? Well, look, on the aerial photograph, we've got the two temples now. Yeah. We've got the ring feature. Mm. But if you come this way, there's a sort of splurge at that point there. We've now looked at it with resistance. So, again, follow that line between the two temples. We've got a clear high-resistance response. I mean, that suggests to me a, a sort of small building structure at this point. I mean, we're in the yard outside the, the main temples, and it's in these yards, these open spaces, that that's where you get the, the sacrifices and, and, and the religious offerings. A sort of altar? Yes, an altar, something like that. Central While back in Phil's trench, oh, ah, there we go. the blob on the geophys had turned up trumps. Well, I'm damned. Phil? <laughs> They're jumping up and down, saying that look, you've got some kind of floor. We have, look, a little mosaic floor, look. Wow. Look, look, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? That's a surprise, isn't it? Well, it is, totally. So do you think that this is what John was seeing in the geophys? I'm almost certainly, yeah. Well, in that case, there could be a heck of a lot of it. Francis? We've extended this trench now. It's another temple. Another temple? Is that four temples or am I dreaming? It's four temples, Tony, and this is now turning into a major Roman temple complex. I mean, it is of national importance. Time Team had made an amazing discovery. The location of a previously unknown Romano-British temple complex where local people would have visited to worship the gods. The circular feature that John had spotted on his resistivity survey was a circular temple that may well have contained a huge monument. Even with all this technology, there comes a point where we have to dig in order to see if Jiffers is right or if they've just discovered someone's buried Ford Cortina. This means explaining all their high-tech stuff to the digging team and people like Phil. He and John have been working together on Time Team for the best part of 17 years and they've got completely different attitudes towards archaeological sites, which means that over the years they've developed, shall we say, a very special relationship. Yeah, John? Yeah. Uh, thanks for this, by the way. Okay. There's been some huge changes in Geophys since we've known each other. Are you going to be putting Phil out of a job in the not-too-distant future? Well, I wouldn't put him out of a job, but, I mean, he's got to buy the beer, so he's got to earn something. <laughs> but, I mean, I think his time's almost up. Because? Well, I mean, archaeology today is not like it used to be. They're digging small test pits, trenches here and there. Without the geophysics, they don't have the context for what they're digging. In the past, when we started 20 years ago, we were doing half a dozen squares. Now we're doing half a dozen hectares. Without us, archaeology's lost. 
<laughs> I've never heard of so many one-liners coming out of the mouth of what I thought was a reasonable sort of a chap. How do you know where to dig unless you've got geophysics? <laughs> you go in blind and you miss the features. Look, I grant you, some archaeology is done in quite small areas. We are often guided by the misguided interpretations of geophysics. But they don't actually tell you what is there. Yes, and I, you you, hang on, my old you... mate, you, you had a clear run. Let me have a clear run, if you don't mind. We actually find stuff. We actually find evidence of where people were living. We can see where the people were living. We can see their rubbish pits. We can see the ditches that they construct. We can see the buildings that they construct. We can see their fires, their hearths. So, Phil, if John's right, it looks like you're going to have to find yourself a proper job. <laughs> you're having a laugh. All the evidence that he supposedly finds on his geophysics, we can actually prove or disprove when we actually strip the area off. We don't actually need that part of the geophysics. But when you're actually stripping the stuff off, you're destroying all the archaeology. <laughs> yeah. just no, like we you don't. Said. What we're doing is stripping off the topsoil so we can actually see the archaeology underneath. And what we can do then is actually find the artifacts that tell us actually what people were doing, the type of pots they were making, the sort of coins that. that they were minting. One thing they cannot definitely do, they can't tell you how old it is. So what's the future of archaeology then, to dig or not to dig? You've got to dig. <laughs> That's a geophys first. It won the Battle of Britain, stops airliners flying into one another and was invented by bats. But now radar is the top gizmo in the Geophys toolbox. The only downside is that it costs an arm and a leg, so we don't bring it on every gig. But in the hands of an expert, the results can sometimes blow your socks off. We've buried ten items in this field, and John Gator's challenge is to correctly locate them all. Radar is his last shot, having already tried the magnetometer and the resistivity machines. If he can't find our treasure with this, there's something seriously wrong. With radar, you've got a transmitter and a receiver. Energy sent into the ground, and when it hits different surfaces, it bounces back. And the speed taken to bounce back gives you an idea of the depth of those different surfaces. And so you're starting to see things in 3D. So this really is a pretty good machine, isn't it? Yeah, this is the way forward. And it cuts your lawn as well. Only joking. I know one problem associated with this is it's pretty expensive, but it can do quite a lot, can't it? In theory, yes. It will see through concrete, it will see through tarmac. Normal soils, no problem at all. But it's not good on clay because the clay acts like a sponge and it absorbs all that energy. Which of our finds do you think it'll get? Well, I mean, in theory, it should get all of them with the exception of the bone. We'll come back later to see if John's right. One site that benefited from the use of radar was Binchester, the site of an old Roman fort near Hadrian's Wall. Time Team went there in 2008 to search for Roman remains. None of us could have predicted what we found. John started the day by surveying the area outside the fort with the magnetometer and came up with some intriguing results. As regards the area in, in Hull, I mean, presumably, as you go away, it looks like it's thinning right out. <laughs> you wish. Oh, you, 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 you definitely... Ah, oh, that's not fair. <laughs> 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 Ooh. This is where it gets exciting. I mean, that looks like a temple, doesn't it? <laughs> you said it. So the diggers got to work straight away, while our Roman expert Guy cast his rather sceptical eye over John's new radar results. I'd thought the resistance image was exciting until I saw this new information. I've never been in an experience before where we showed the archaeologists this geophys and they all immediately went, it's a temple, it's a temple. They're normally so cautious. Now, this is the radar that John's done. Look at that face. Do you see that face? <laughs> How long did it take you to look at that, you old cynic? <laughs> this here is our temple, and that was the blob in the middle. Well, I don't think it's a temple oh. because... 
a Romano Celtic temple wouldn't normally turn up here, that, which is that kind of shape. I'd guess that that's more likely to turn out to be the mausoleum of maybe a commanding officer of this fort. And of course, Guy was bang on. Well, this is starting to look like a possible mausoleum. We thought we were outside this building, we're actually inside it because we've got the return wall. So, what we're going to do now, we're going to strip away a little bit more of the ground to that side. So you're going to take this part of the trench from here back this way, yeah? Yeah. But when I returned to the trench a couple of hours later, I got a bit of a shock. I knew that we were going to extend this trench in that direction, but now we've extended it all the way up to here, even though this morning the archaeologists said to me they didn't want to do any more archaeology other than what was already on their plates, and they didn't want to find anything new. But they have, and now oh. I name these three <laughs> guilty oh, I men. I thought you were going to come at us about this. Why? Look at the geophysics. Well, not only look at the geophysics, look at the trench. When Jackie extended, she got the main wall of the mausoleum, and she got that second wall, and if you look at the radar, We've got these fantastic results. There's the main mausoleum wall. Here's the second wall cutting across here, turning through a right angle. Now it looks from the geophysics that we've got a series of these mausoleums going along the road. That's fantastically interesting. It's not the sort of thing we get a lot of in this country. What do we think this is? In an hour or two's time, we'll be able to tell you that. When you've dug it? When we've dug it. <laughs> like you weren't going to yeah, do I'm any more not. digging this morning. Get lost. Go on, <laughs> clear off. <laughs> You'll be glad we've dug it. Yeah, exactly. While Phil opened a trench over the strange geophys circle, the rest of the site was giving up its secrets. Look at that. Oh, there's a crack down this side, but that's, that's it, it otherwise. Oh, yes. Phew. <laughs> Ooh. There you go. Jolly good. So, Phil, have we found our mysterious circular feature? We have, but it's not circular, it's square. <laughs> this is it. Well, why does it look circular on the geophysics? Well, I think the fact is that the inside of it does look circular. But actually, when you look at the geophysics too, you see, look, you've got that straight edge there and there's another straight edge there. Yeah. I think you could interpret that as a square mausoleum. When we came to Binchester in search of Roman remains, we didn't count on geophys discovering a street lined with grand tombs, the first found in Britain for over 150 years and in the centre of the street would have sat the grandest mausoleum of them all. Antonius, my brother and fellow comrade soldier, we've come down the street of tombs to venerate the memory of our great ancestor, our great-great-grandfather, the mighty general who once acted as a soldier here, and we've come down to his tomb. Now, we've got to go through the vast, mighty door that would have once been here, pivoting there on iron, and in we come to the mausoleum area, and towering above us here is his grave with an inscription that records his name, his mighty exploits. And although we needed to dig the site to fully understand it, it was the radar that led us to this important find. John has finally scanned our buried time team items with all three geophys machines. Now the radar results are in and it's crunch time. He may be able to find a mausoleum, but can he find our toilet? Mag res radar. How did it all go? Uh, pretty tough. Um, pretty tough. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm confident about the magnetic results. They're very clear responses. The trouble is, mm. what's the difference between a bike and a pile of tyres? Well, unfortunately, the resistance doesn't help you, really, with either. Now, the radar does, because you get specific responses from metal. So if I can match those responses in the radar with the mag, that helps me with the interpretation. So here's a reminder of what John had to find. Concrete blocks, some tyres, laptop and mobile phones, a bicycle, bricks, a loaded shopping basket, a state-of-the-art toilet, a big bin, a do-it-yourself ditch, some bone and a cuddly toy. Oh no, wrong show. Do you reckon you can work out where any of these are from that? Um, I'm confident that that must be the bike. Bike, OK. Top right. That's the tyres. Tyres, OK, so it's I'm down here. I'm putting my head on the line here, <laughs> you know. The bin must be plastic because it's not given a metal response. Bin here? Bin there and toilet there. Bricks down here. Now, that could be the concrete blocks. 
<laughs> this is difficult. To be fair to John, he'd normally have an entire day to interpret the results. But hey, time is money, so we gave him 45 minutes. I think you put the shopping basket there. Yeah, right? shopping basket, sorry, the yeah. mobile phone to the side yeah. and the concrete maybe at the top. How have I done? Come over here and I'll show you. The most interesting thing is that you've got the positioning of the finds absolutely right. Well, that's the easy bit. Mobile phone and laptop, bullseye. Bang on the money. Tires, bang on the money. You said bricks here, it was actually the blocks, but... But I did say the bricks could swap with the blocks. You did, were the, you did. Were yeah. the bricks up there? The bricks were where you ah. put the basket. So those two you got the wrong way round. Toilet and the bin should have been well, swapped round. Well, I said the other yeah. way round, but uh, I was right, it's a plastic bin. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The bike, bang on the money. So, <laughs> virtually, you got them all right, except sometimes there were two that were the wrong way round that you weren't quite able to analyse. Well, so, I thought, I'll tell you the truth, I thought you were going to be rubbish. But you weren't. Most people do think <laughs> I'm going to be rubbish. <laughs> John, I think you did incredibly well, except that you didn't get the bones. Yeah, but th there isn't such a thing as a bone detector. They're the most difficult target for geophysics. But you see it all the time on the telly, the policemen find bodies. No, no, you've been watching too much of CSI. It just does not work. We cannot detect bones. Well, it was a really interesting experiment, and we're not going to let you go empty-handed. I'd like to give you <laughs> a present. Thank you very much. You can learn how to use that now. Well, this is obviously one of Phil's. It's not been used at all. <laughs> uh, we also uh, ah! put in a red herring, which you didn't get, so uh, I'll have that. <laughs> it's been the best part of 20 years since we first shoved a spade into the ground on a time team dig, and during that time, the technology behind Geophys has moved faster than Phil Hardy on his way to the local pub from black and white photos to animated 3D images. Who knows what the next 10 to 20 years may bring? What we really need is a machine that we'll see into the future. John? Can a new dig tell us more about Boudicca and her talented and dynamic people? Tony's back checking out her lost tribe Wednesday at 9. Tonight at 9, great movie. Jason Statham's tunneling, tunneling into one of London's vaults for the bank job. Channel 4 News comes next, huh?